Recite ye the verses of God every morning and evening. Whoso reciteth them not hath truly failed to fulfill his pledge to the covenant of God and his testament. And whoso in this day turneth away therefrom hath indeed turned away from God since time immemorial. Fear ye God, O concourse of my servants. Take heed, lest excessive reading and too many acts of piety in the daytime and in the night season make you vainglorious. Should a person recite but a single verse from the holy writings in a spirit of joy and radiance, this would be better for him than reciting wearily all the scriptures of God, the help in peril, the self-subsisting. Recite ye the verses of God in such measure that ye be not overtaken with fatigue or boredom. Burden not your souls so as to cause exhaustion and weigh them down, but rather endeavor to lighten them, that they may soar on the wings of revealed verses unto the dawning place of his signs. This is conducive to nearer access unto God, were ye to comprehend. Baha'u'llah. So today our speaker is Mr. Daru Shlami, and his topic is three plus one steps to effective prayer. Mr. Lami is an author and researcher in history and philosophy. Among his notable works is a comprehensive research book titled Abdul Baha, the Perfect Exemplar, which delves into the life and writings of Abdul Baha. In addition to this significant publication, he's contributed numerous articles to various Baha'i publications in the Persian language. Having pursued studies in architecture and Islamic studies at UCLA, Daryush brings a unique interdisciplinary perspective to his research and writing. Currently, he's focused on the exploration of the mysteries of prayers, a subject that promises to be a compelling focus for his upcoming book. So with that, I'll hand it off to Mr. Lamy. Hello, dear friends. Good morning and Allah pa to everyone or good afternoon to some of you in different parts of the world. Uh, I'm going to talk for about 30 minutes or so, try to be very brief about a topic that I think is very near to all of us. And sometimes it is a simple topic, but at the same time can be a very, very complex topic the topic of the prayer, and hopefully I'm going to give you a new view of some different aspects of the prayer. Uh, the question always is, to start, is what is a prayer? What is the purpose of a prayer? And actually why we pray, and sometimes we need to know do we really need to pray or not? And how we need to pray and achieve our goals? And what is basically a prayer good for? And how prayers would affect us? Uh, to start, I did some research about the question, how widespread is praying? Basically, the question is, how many people in the world are praying. Let me give you some statistics according to my brief research about that. Uh, we have over 2 billion Christians in the world, and Christianity has more than 37 million churches. Islam has over 1.9 billion followers. And it has over 3.6 million mosques in the world. Judaism has 14 million Jews. And they have more than 20,000 synagogues in the world. And Hinduism has more than 1 billion followers in the world. And they have more than 2 million temples in the world. Buddhism has 520 million followers. And just Thailand alone has over 40,000 temples. Zoroastrians, in Zoroast Zoroastrians, there are more than 120,000 followers, 
And only in India and Iran, they have about 167 temples. And the Baha'i popula population in the world are more than 8 million. So these are just brief statistics. How many followers of different religions we have in the world? But the question is, how many people in the world are praying? The more you do research, the harder it becomes to come up with even exact number or an approximate number. But what we know for sure that hundreds of millions of people pray in the world. Hundreds of millions of people regularly go to the church or their temples and pray. Now the question is, after all these prayers, we look at the world, how is this world right now? Do we have a better world? Do we have a peaceful world? But let me also mention, it's interesting to know, that I was looking at the statistics of different countries that the percentage of how many people go to the church and, and, and pray. Indonesia is the highest, meaning 92% of people live in Indonesia pray. And Nigeria becomes the second. 89% of people living in Nigeria pray. And the chart continues all the way to the bottom. And one of the bottom of the list becomes Denmark. Only 2% of the people in Denmark pray. So basically when we look at this chart, uh, we see that people who live in the most disadvantaged countries pray more and people who live in the most comfortable countries, they pray, pray, they pray uh, less. So the question comes is that either, either we say the wrong prayers to God or God is not hearing our prayers after hundreds of millions of people are praying weekly. Or the third option is that we need to change the way we pray today. So my focus in this uh, brief, very brief presentation, which is it takes hours and hours, but I try to summarize it in, in a few minutes, is that how we need to pray and how we need to change the way we pray. I need also to mention, friends, that prayer is not only for religions, meaning in the recorded history, there are, before even there was a mention of any religion, we see that there is recorded incidences that people, the primitive people, used to pray. But the religions, when they come to existence, they give us prayers, different forms of prayers, encourages us, religions encourage us to pray, and they tell us how to pray and how to behave. So basically, people can have no religion in the world right now, but still pray. So, People, the reason that is like that, the science shows that I'm going to review now, that people need to pray because the human brain is designed as such. The brain is designed that it is a necessity for our brain to pray. But praying can be different and in different languages, different formats. Even what is interesting, last several years, UCLA, which is a well-known university in California, in Los Angeles, that they did research and they came out with, a, with these statistics that 31% of students have no religions, students at UCLA. 31% of 
they have no religions. But 34% of them who say we have no religions, they are they said that we are on a spiritual quest. So religion is very affiliated to prayer, but doesn't mean that the people who pray are religious. As we know, according to the recent statistics, that the church attendance declined for last several years and decades, but the spiritual interest increased. So spirituality is different from this point of view than attendance to the church. So let me give you a little bit of more overview of this uh, prayer. What is prayer? We know prayer by itself is a tool, is an instrument, is a tool to help us to change our life, is a tool to help us to become a better human being, is a change when we know that we if we want to change, we have to change first our brain and the life will be changed. And prayer is a tool that can help us in this process of change. So prayer by itself is not a goal, but a, but a mean, but a tool, but an instrument to change our, our life through changing and affecting our brain. So the first step to change our brain is to know the brain and how it functions. And today I'm going to uh, review the process of how a prayer can effectively work in our brain, in our in our brain. So. Uh, what is very also important that wherever we live in the world, in if not all, but most countries in the world, they have a day dedicated to prayer. Either they call it annual day of prayer, or they can call it world day of prayer. For instance, in the United States, there is a, a, a day that we pray is a national day of prayer is the used to be the name used to be women's world day of prayer it is because this day this day was started with women so we can women can do a lot in the world and one of the things they did and they could do and was very successful to dedicate the day it used to be the name used to be women's world day of prayer so now that changed, the name changed to a national day of prayer. And it is the first Thursday of May. In the US, every year, first Thursday of the May is called the national day of prayer. This has been uh, called like this by President Reagan. Also, I need to mention that prayer doesn't be belong to religions only, as I said. Many poets, many thinkers, many writers, many elite people also have written many different prayers that you can find online. Even when we look at through history, we see that uh, even some kings in the world had people uh, full-time people dedicated to writing prayers for them. One of them is the king of Iran, Muzaffaradin Shah, who used to have a full-time employee on his side. His job was always to write prayer for the king of Iran. For years and years, that all he did was to write prayer for him. Now the question is, we want to get to, again, after all of this, maybe brief introduction, because the topic is three plus one step, means we need to, I need to focus more on how to pray. Basically, I should say how to pray more effectively. 
So first, I need to mention that what is the definition of a prayer? Friends, the prayer in simple words is communication with God. That's established definition. We can find it everywhere in a simple word. When we, we, when we want to ask what is prayer, prayer is communication with God. But for the first time in the history of mankind and in the history of old religions, Abdul Baha, the son of Baha'u'llah, revolutionized even this definition and this concept. He came up with two definitions about the answering what is prayer. He came up with one definition is, is basically a, a, in action. One is prayer are two types, he said. One is in action and one is in word. Abdul Baha uh, said many times that most of the time I am praying. This is a statement of Abdul Baha. He said, most of the time I am praying. And we know that he was a very, very busy person, seven days a week working and serving others. So by that he's saying the service is praying. This is one definition. Service is praying. The other type of definition of the uh, uh, praying is in words, is in language. That is my focus today. Now, we need to learn the language of communication, the language of prayer, and the content of communication. Three plus one a step, that is the title of today's uh, talk, is the language of communication. What are these four steps? I call it three plus one, of course, four. What are these four steps that we can have a more effective pray, prayer? Uh, about the content, uh, allow me to mention also the actual prayer text. When I say about the content, the actual prayer text teach us the content, meaning what to ask God and what not to ask. Basically, the content of prayer shows us the way we need to think, the way we need to live, the way we need to act, the way we need to set our goals, and the way we really need to uh, uh, direct our, our path. So in other words, prayers are tools to teach us qualities and virtues. It is to cultivate certain virtues and qualities, especially the virtue of humility. That's why in many of the prayers, you see that we are seeking humility before God. So that is a, a spiritual a, education. And the most important virtue that any human being can, can acquire and desire is humbleness is the most important uh, uh, virtue to develop. So let me get into more of the, uh, the steps. <clears throat> when I say steps, the prayer, <clears throat> many religions <clears throat> use one analogy and they use the analogy of a ladder. You look through all the religions, you see this concept of ladder. They all use that prayers are like ladders to, to connect us to God. But at the same time, in the Baha'i writings, the uh, analogy of a ladder goes for three, for goes for two other areas, total of three areas. Uh, I mean, uh, they focus also in three areas, the, the concept, the analogies used. Basically, one is in science, that when they want to explain in the Baha'i writings about science, what is science, we use an analogy of ladder. <clears throat> the second area 
that this uh, analogy of ladder is being used in the Baha'i writings is in music, that music is like a ladder. And the third area is the prayer and meditation. That is our focus today. Meaning these three are like ladders through which we ascend to a higher level of being. As science is like a ladder to take us to a new vision and new understanding. Now, let's look at the ladder. Basically, the, its function is from getting us from, the, for instance, the first floor to the second floor. So the ladder is connecting where we are, the, let's say first floor, and the level higher, let's say to the roof. This function of the ladder is to connect from one floor to the next floor. Uh, we use the ladder to connect to a superior, and after connecting, we need to communicate. So it's not just going up the ladder. After we go up the ladder, we need, we go to the roof. When we are at the roof, after saying the prayer, we need to communicate. To communicate in praying, it means to meditate. So meditation is another word in this concept, is another word uh, for communication. Now, let me use an analogy of the ladder that is used in the Baha'i faith extensively. First step, three plus one. The first one is we, we need to uh, prepare for praying. We need to be prepared to say a prayer. Meaning we need to get ready to pray. This Getting ready to pray means the attitude of prayer. Or, that is according to my writings, or to create the desire to communicate. So when we read in the Baha'i writings that we need to have an attitude of prayer or to create a desire to communicate, it means get ready for prayer. Using the analogy of a ladder, we need to bring the ladder from somewhere at, from home. It is maybe in the storage room. Set it in a secure and a stable position and make sure that the ladder is safe. So for us, that we want to say a prayer, it means we need to sit and position ourselves in a comfortable position and stay silent for a few moments and focus our 100% attention that we are going to start to communicate with the Almighty. Meaning, we need to put all the other thoughts on the side and have a full 100% laser attention for the prayer. So this was step number one. We, we cannot just sit quickly without any attention, just start saying, oh God, oh God. So that we can do, of course, any way that we want, but it, it wouldn't be as effective as we really wish the prayer would have effect on our brain. Now, after we have this ladder set, we need to go to the second step. We need to start saying the prayer. That means, using the same analogy of a ladder, means to going up the ladder. When we go up to the ladder, we need to keep in mind a few points, a few important principles, I think. Number one, we need to be careful not to fall down from the steps of the ladder. We have to be very careful. Meaning we have to be 100% laser focused when we say our prayer. Every step of this ladder, friends, is like the words, the sentences that we say in this prayer. Another principle 
is say the appropriate prayer for the moment. Not we have many different type of play, uh, prayers for many different type of occasions in the Baha'i writings. Basically, no other religions has these many different type of prayers as, the, as in the Baha'i writings. Islam has a lot of prayers also. But when we compare the Baha'i prayers, there are volumes and volumes of, of, of uh, prayers for different occasions. Another principle uh, I was uh, mentioning also to keep in mind is we need to really pay attention to each word and the meaning of each word when we pray. So if we saying we are, if you're saying a prayer and we don't understand a word or a sentence, we really need to look it up and understand what we are talking. Because we say the prayer not for God. God doesn't need our prayer. The prayer is for ourselves to improve, to get a better understanding. And so in, once we are saying this prayer, we really need to understand and internalize each word and the meaning of each word. So uh, understanding and internalizing each word and, and sentence is extremely important. Also, friends, another important point to keep in mind is that some prayers are an invitation to think. Because prayers has one aspect, certain prayers, to educate us, as I mentioned before, what to think, how to think, meaning what to be and how to be. And invitation to think is another aspect of certain prayers. One of the very famous certain prayers or zikr in the Baha'i writings is the one that all are familiar is, is there any remover of difficulties? You see this zikr or this brief prayer uh, uh, from the writings of the Bab, that one basically, the first sentence of that is invitation to think. Is it is there is a question? I start with a question mark. Is there any remover of difficulties? Meaning they invite us to think, is there anyone else who can help us in this process or not? Then the answer comes after that. So each zik has an explanation by itself. So I don't cover those here. Another very, very important to have an effective uh, the second step. Uh, effective prayer is the foundation of an effective prayer is our belief and our faith. Meaning that we really need to believe in that. And we really need to have faith in that prayer and its effect. If you're doubtful, if maybe it's effective, but much less. We need to have conviction that this prayer is going to be uh, effective. There has been lots of university research on that. One of them, they have came, they came up and said, the moment we encounter God or the idea of God, our brain uh, begins to change. Let me uh, show you here. So the books that are very helpful to explain that this is one of them that how God changes your brain is very extensive, is all researched by the universities. Another one is why God won't go away, that another one is here. And there are a lot more just because of the time. I just give you a couple of examples. From this university, research university, I'd like to read, uh, I don't know if we have how much time I have, but I read it, uh, do we have time? Or I will read it maybe, it's a few lines, because I have a lot of things to share, but I, my time is limited. Here, 
in this uni research university, they wrote down that for most American children, <clears throat> this occurs in the first year of life when they come face to face with the holy day, with holy religious symbolism. Brightly colored Christmas trees and Easter basket rivet a child's attention and his imprints and, per and permanent image into memory. Later, when they are introduced a, to parental concepts of God, these ideas become neurologically connected to either memories and thoughts. Images built up, build, build upon images and concept built upon concept until a complex neurological circuit emerges that represents a primitive system of religious belief. So this, a lot of research has been done about this step of going up the ladder and uh, saying the prayer. Now the third one, the third step is that going, when we go up the ladder, we go to the next level, we go to the roof as an example. Once we say our prayer, once we go up through the steps after steps of this ladder, we pay complete attention, a laser attention to these words and sentences, and we finish the prayer. We meaning we finish, we are up the ladder, we are at the roof, we are at the destination, we finish the prayer. Now we sit there and we have intense contemplation. We have reflection that we call it meditation. So meditation is after reading all these words, these sentences, we got to the end of it, and we need to sit for a few moments, a few minutes, to reflect upon what we read. And have intense contemplation, meaning having meditation. What is, is extremely important in the Baha'i writings is that you can see that when, by, when you read these Baha'i writings, you many, many, many times, you see that the mention of prayer after that is, is the word meditation. So prayer as meditation go together. And it's very important. If we pray and we don't meditate, we are wasting our time, friends. We are wasting our time because prayer is like a food, like a vitamin. Like at the beginning of our gathering, the lady was reading from the Baha'i writings that in the morning and in the evening, you recite or read the Baha'i writings. The reason that we read it twice is that when we read it in the morning, we have time to think about it reflect upon, upon it and meditate upon what we read in the morning or basically digest them during the day until evening we get hungry again and we need to read more, to think about it, to digest it. Meaning to internalize all what we read. Meditation does not belong to any specific religion. And not only that, doesn't belong to even any, any to, to religions at all. Meditation is a scientific methodology. It's methods. Meditation uses many different methods to achieve different goals. And we have many different types of meditations. For instance, we have Mindful meditations, again, these are methods, is a methodology that religions use, need to use to have a more effective uh, prayer. So for instance, meditation like mindful meditation, like transcendental meditation, like um, guided med meditation, even what is interesting, I was doing research for my 
the writing was a, a, a something like loving kindness meditation. Loving kindness meditation. Medi that is meditation that aims to cultivate an attitude of love and kindness towards everything, even a person's enemy and a source of stress. While breathing deeply, practitioners open their minds to receiving loving uh, kindness. There are other meditation like yoga meditation that is very popular in the U.S., maybe wherever you live. Mantra meditation. As I said, there are many, many different types of meditation. But what is extremely important, this prayer and meditation, it cannot be done in one session. We don't get anything out of it in one session. The secret of success of prayer and meditation is only in one word. Here. I mean, there are a lot of things to it. But what is what I'm emphasizing is that what is the, the most important secret, maybe I can say, is to repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat. It is like going to a gym. And when we go to the gym, we need to exercise. If we just go to the gym once a year or once a month, we don't get any result. If we decide to be in good shape physically, we need to go to the gym and exercise regularly, meaning repeating and repeating. If you do it three times a week, four times a week, five times a week, after a while, we see the result. If we get into our car, friends, we want to go to the gym and exercise. We drive to the gym, we come out of the car, and we look at the building, and we sit back in the car, and we come back home. That means we say our prayer, but we don't meditate. Going to the gym is like saying our prayer and then meditate after that. Is going to the gym and exercise. So this can help and this communication needs to be compassionate. This compassion communication little by little can change, can change the way we look at things. You know, in the University of Pennsylvania, those who live in the in America, they know that it's a very, very good school, very prestigious school in the University of Pennsylvania. They have a, a, a center, it's called the Center for Spirituality and Mind. You can Google it, you can find out the Center for Spirituality and Mind. They have budget, they have staff, they do a lot of research. And at this moment this year, now they are studying Sikhs, Sufis, yoga practitioners, and advanced meditators, meditators to map the neurochemical changes caused by spiritual and religious practices. So they're looking at it very, very scientifically. So the conclusions of their research at the University of Pennsylvania I summarized it into the following points. One of them is that each part of the brain, they say, this is scientific, purely scientific research, friends. They say each part of the brain construct a different perception of God. So I want to make sure we focus on the meditation. These are the research by the University of Pennsylvania. Number one is that each part of the brain construct a different perception of God. Every human brain assembles its perception of God in uniquely different ways. And Dr. Waldman, a renowned neurologist who does this research, reported all of that. This all credits goes to him. The second principle, they came out and they said, if you contemplate God long enough, something surprising happens in the brain. 
neural functioning begins to change. Different circuits become activated while others become deactivated. Very interesting. And another one, they, another principle they came up, they concluded that spiritual practices enhance the neural functioning of the brain in ways that improve physical and emotional health. The next important conclusion they came out was that intense and long-term long contemplation of God, meaning going to the gym continuously and exercising continuously and repeatedly. That's why they say intense long-term contemplation of God and other spiritual values appears to permanently change the structure of those parts of the brain that control our moods. This is extremely important. That we need. And also another point that they came up, the University of Pennsylvania, they said contemplated uh, practices strengthen a specific neurological circuit that generates peacefulness, social awareness, and compassion for others. There are, uh, I don't want to, there are other things that they said, I don't want to take much of your time. Now, it is very interesting also, they concluded that uh, the question was how quickly the meditation can affect our brain. If we do it continuously, uh, go and meditate. They said recent evidence has shown, this is scientific research with the University of Pennsylvania. They said recent evidence has shown that uh, neuronal changes uh, can take place in literally a matter of hours. Start the matter of hours. Let me read for you something that they published that is very interesting. This is from the University of Pennsylvania, the research they did. They said the brain has a hundred billion neurons. Neurons. Our brain has hundred billion neurons that connect to others in trillions upon trillions of ways. And no two people have the exact same configuration of connections. As things currently stand in the field of neuroscience, we only have a vague map of a percentage of the neural circuits that control our emotions, behaviors, and thoughts. Also, they concluded another important point is that they said you can change your brain. You are not stuck with the brain you're born with. It's not, you cannot say that you're born like that or I inherited that or this is the way I am or the circumstances have changed in my life. Now this is how I am and it runs in the family. They concluded, no, you can change your brain. You're not stuck with the brain you're born with. There is another, check many different universities, another university is the University of Wisconsin. And they came up, they studied the same concept, how to have more effective meditation. They said, in summary, the time is very important. The longer and more frequently you meditate, the more you change your, you, the more changes you will notice in the brain. And they said, it's interesting, they said for repetition and repeating, repeating, as I was mentioning, they said after eight weeks of daily practice, you will notice small but significant changes in brain activities. So it doesn't work, friends. If we just go to our temple or at home, just one prayer quickly and expect God to do everything else. 
So after eight weeks of daily practice, you will notice a small but significant changes in brain activities. And they said those who practice daily for 30 minutes or longer, every day, 30 minutes or longer, and for many years, show the greatest differences in neural activity. Then we see them. But again, they said, have 100% laser uh, attention for them. When Abdul Baha, son of Baha'u'llah, was traveling, traveling in the US more than 100 years ago, one of the ladies asked him, how can I have a, live a Baha'i life? And Abdul Baha's response to this lady was, you need to do three things. Number one, which is important and more important, more important than anything else, is he said, Abdul Baha said to this lady, pray and meditate. Again, pray and meditate. Then Second thing you can do is study the divine writings. Friends, studying is different from reading. Reading is different from studying. We can read newspaper, magazine, Facebook, you know, slogans, this and that, we read them. But studying meaning having 100% attention, understanding it, Inter internalizing what we read. A studying means really getting to the bottom of it. And for that, a studying is not one time. We can read and reread and reread as it was mentioned at the beginning of this program that we need to really read every day in the morning and every day in the evening. That is after a while scientific research showed that can have change in our brain and in our life. Number third point that Abdul Ba said to this lady, he said, reflect on her life. He said, reflect on your life. And reflect on your end. And think about death. Think about the next world. So that was the third step. Now, what is Three plus one, the fourth and final step after all of these. Just reflecting, thinking, praying, getting ready. After we did all of that, the number four, we need to see the result. Believe me, is not just sitting back, enjoying our view. And so we did our part. We said, God, what to do? When you ask what to do, God do this, God do that, and we sit, and I says, okay, why God is not doing what we ask? I ask him many times, why is not God is not responding? Because we need to go to the fourth step. The fourth step is consult and action. Consult and action. Consult with experts and well-intentioned people. Consult with experts and well-intentioned people. Whatever comes up in our mind during meditation, follow it up with consultation and action. So uh, I think I, I can end here because this topic can go on and on. Let me stop here. I appreciate your time, and uh, I'm, I'll be happy if I can help. Uh, uh, if I can answer any questions, thank you for your attention, friends. I don't know really how much I talked, but I think I should stop here. Thank you so much. That was really interesting. It's such an important topic because you know we all pray every day or at least as a regular part of our lives. So thank you so much. Um, if people have questions, you can put it in the chat. We have some time for a Q and A. Um, in your bio, it says you're writing a book on prayer. I'm very interested in this. Any idea when it will be published and by which publisher? I don't want to miss it. 
Yeah, I don't know yet. Uh, again, it would be years from now. Uh, it's uh, again, so far I've written about 100 pages, maybe it would be another uh, couple of hundred pages. So uh, still I'm doing a lot of more research and a lot of more taking notes and a lot of readings, hundreds and hundreds of or thousands of pages, but hopefully once it's done, then see who wanna publish. Yeah, it's still, again, a few years away. Would you comment on the Guardian's statement about prayer, which he says act as though it has already happened? Oh, sure. This one is very interesting again. It is, I think it has a scientific uh, uh, reason for that. I mentioned to this point, very briefly that when we pray, we need to be convinced and have conviction and have belief that will happen. The garden is referring to the same concept as the belief of happen as if as, as if it happened is that we are 100% sure that our prayer will be effective meaning have no doubt in your mind that the prayer will have a, a will have an answer but we have to realize again it goes into deeper than that that we have we will have an answer when we pray that is no doubt about it but there are important points that we need to consider our expectation of an answer of a prayer is that sometimes we need to get an answer exactly that what we asked, meaning a positive answer to what exactly we asked. We get an answer, but we are not guaranteed 100% that we get exactly what we ask. The best prayer is when we ask that God please do what is best for me because you know it better than I do. Many times we can ask God something that is not, is not good for us, but we get the answer. Another point is that the timing of an answer. We may get it immediately, but it may, it may time, take some time to receive the answer. But we have to have a conviction conviction that we will, that the guardian is talking about, at, at least to my limited understanding, is that believe in that, this will happen. Because when we believe in that, our neurons in our brain work like that, that it would be more powerful, more, more, uh, uh, it would gear more towards happening what we are asking from God. This is at least my let me take. I don't know if I answered your question or, or there is more into it. I'll be more than happy. I, I hope I, I'll, I'll in all these zooms uh, when I uh, talk. I hope to create more questions than answers, because if I create more questions, uh, friends would be encouraged to go and read more and be more interested in different uh, topics like that. But. Uh, but I'll be more than happy. I hope it helped to give you a different, a new perspective of how we need to pray and the way we need to pray, what we need to ask, what not the educational part of the praying, what and not not uh, uh, asking what we are not supposed to ask. Thank you. The next question is, how do you personally meditate? Which methodology do you find well suited? Again, uh, meditation is can be different for each individual. You know, uh, you can you can meditate the way that suits you personally. Something that anybody can choose. Uh, yoga system is a very good one. Another one that. I really like is mindfulness, meaning basically when you say your prayer in a very quiet place, 
in your favorite spot. When you sit, you can really, after you, you get ready to that praying, after you start uh, uh, meditating, you need to, sometimes you need to get to your brain and many times it's better also looking at it differently. What I do personally, I try to get out of the situation and look at it from outside, try to understand the topic that I'm trying to meditate better. It's like you're looking at a building, at the, at the house, you're looking where we live. When we get out of the house and we look at it from a different angle, eye bird view, you can get a better understanding of the building and on the uh, where we where we live. So different things can happen. It can you can use it yoga. You can use it mindful meditation. You can contemplate many things. But what one thing for sure, it needs to be in a very quiet, very uh, cozy area for yourself to play to be more effective, and it needs to be continuously going and going. That's why you see, at least in America, yoga has been very popular because people see the result uh, that how it can affect their brain. In a devotional gathering where people pray and then the next person prays, how effective are those prayers? Uh, it's a very good. The question, all prayers are effective to a different degrees. I wouldn't say one is not effective at all. Uh, my emphasis today was how we can have personally, or even it can be collectively, more effective uh, praying. In a devotional gatherings, of course, I usually what I would suggest that at the beginning, we have maybe even five minutes of a, a presentation, how to pray and what is the best way to pray and how to, what is the best way of more effective praying. Collectively, it can be also very useful. It can be very useful or individually, it doesn't matter because what it matters, wherever we sit is how we connect to our brain, to the, to our, to the uh, activities in our brain and be free of thinking anything else. Devotional meetings are fantastic. Actually, these devotional meetings that we see all over is a very important tool to create a new ambience, to create a new culture, the culture of praying that this culture of praying becomes a permanent feature of the not only just the Baha'i communities, but all over. It's not just for Baha'is. All over. It needs to be permanent feature of our daily life or our weekly life. That even for a few minutes, either individually or collectively, we sit and we bring this culture. We need to expand this culture. It has many different effects. One of them in this prayer is when we, when we say the prayer, as I mentioned, it tells us how to be, what to be, what not to be, the way we need to think, the way that is better for us. One example, for instance, in many of the writings and many of the prayers of the Baha'i faith, it shows, it tells us to, it teaches us to be humble. You know, this servant or this, uh, we, we, we read these different uh, wordings that tells us, are teaching us and educating us, as I mentioned, uh, to be humble. So why they do that, not only humbleness is very, very important virtues in the Baha'i faith, even Abdul Baha'i in one of his tablets says, when uh, just Abdul Baha tried to explain it to an individual, then when somebody passed away, he went to the next world. The God asked him again, just trying to explain that. Abdul Baba says, the God asked him, What did you do in the previous life? He says, Well, I acquired, I went to the best universities, I acquired many different degrees. He says, Okay, you, I acquired knowledge. The, the, he would, the response would be, Yes. 
uh, that is good, but uh, we have a lot of knowledge. God is the most knowledgeable one. God is all knowing. What else? He said, I became very uh, rich. I made a lot of money. I, I came with a lot of uh, wealth. He says, no, Allah uh, Ghani, God is really rich, the most rich of everybody. So that is good, but it's not really what we were expecting from you. And the last one, he said, I acquired this and that. The last one, Abdul Ba says, the guy said, uh, I, uh, I, another person came to the next world. The guy says, I didn't bring anything but humbleness. And he, he, he heard that, yes, this is really the virtue that we would like our people to have to be humble because God has all virtues in the world. The only virtue God does not have is he is not humble. You never see in any of the prayers that says God is humble. So uh, another, again, it is uh, the prayers are educational for us to be educated, what to think, how to think, what to be, what not to be. We know one of the problems of the world right now is arrogance, the wars start, many wars and many problems in between countries because one nation, one government, one uh, country feels superior than the others, feels needs to control other country. That's the reason controlling and feeling superiority is the one of the main causes of these wars and, and all the problems of the world is the feeling of superiority. So in Baha'i uh, writings and Baha'i uh, prayers teaches us uh, the, the opposite of that, not to feel superior and not to feel better than anybody else. That's why the most important virtue that these prayers teach us and the Baha'i writing teach us is the virtue of humbleness. Can you please expand on the attitude of prayer and how to develop ourselves to resign to the will of God? You see, attitude of prayer, as I mentioned, is getting ready to pray. Attitude of prayer is, as I mentioned, the ladder is being used, even guardian, Shoghi Effendi, is using that a lot as well is that uh, uh, we need, when we say prayer, number one, we need to really position ourselves, think nothing, unlearn everything, put everything on the side, meaning try a few minutes before saying and connecting, because attitude of prayer means we are getting ready to connect. We are getting ready to climb this ladder. We are getting ready to say these words in the prayers, these sentences in the prayer. So number one, we have to calm, calm myself. I have to calm myself and think of nothing except that my focus is 100% laser focus on saying a prayer. I'm getting ready to climb this ladder. I'm getting ready being just, it's basically a mental exercise that anything comes to mind, we have to push it on the side. Anything comes to the mind, we have to put it away. And it's not just once what I said, it can be done that easily. As I said at the beginning, this topic can be very simple but in reality, this topic is very, very complex. That's why you see all over the world, hundreds of millions of people in the world, they are praying. Which is the reason I started doing my research a few years ago, and they ended up to being a book, is that why people pray so much, doesn't matter what religion, you can be Christian, Muslim, you can be Baha'i, you can be Christian, Jews, uh, you can be atheist. I know atheists can pray and they do pray 
differently. They have a different view. But religious people pray. Why still we are like that? Why it did the question is did prayer help humanity or not? If it helped, why the world is like this right now? You know how is the world? So maybe either God is not listening or we are saying the wrong prayer or we don't know how to pray. Or what is prayer? That's the question. So that's why when we get into it from not only spiritual point of view, but from philosophical point of view, when you look at the life and the writings of many philosophers that they talk about the prayer, then we look at this scientific research that has been done about the prayer. So that's why we get it becomes even more and more complex and becomes more and more interesting and becomes a topic that we need to learn more. Every many things that many, many, I mean, a horse is a horse. He doesn't need to learn how to be a horse. They read, they, they write scientists. But humans need to learn how to be humans. You know, everything we need to learn. We, we, are, we, we were born with the potentiality of becoming a human being. Necessarily doesn't mean that when we are in this world, necessarily we are, we, we are naturally just, we don't need to learn anything, we're just humans. The same thing with prayer. We, when we pray, we need to learn how to pray. We need to sit, think, and many times unthink and unlearn from whatever we knew from before. So on learning, that's why one of the most important principles of the Baha'i faith, even the, the first one is, uh, we read is the independent investigation of the truth. Independent investigation of the truth in a simple word is to have critical thinking, meaning do not follow exactly what others are saying or 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 writings. Think about think about them you independently, you yourself. Meaning, do independent research. Think about it yourself. And this topic of prayer also, we each one we need to deepen, internalize, and understand all different aspects of it how we can uh, pray better, how we can, uh, how we can unlearn whatever we were told and how we can expect from the prayer. Do we have a right expectation or we have a wrong expectation of prayer? And number one, as I mentioned before, <clears throat> number one is we pray for ourselves. Like we fast for ourselves. You know, we calculate, for instance, about fasting, that fasting is a devotional also. When we, let's say prayer, one of the important, let me focus on the prayer. Prayer, uh, another important po point about prayer is uh, daily prayer or obligatory prayer, we call it, obligatory prayer. This obligatory prayer, when we are become 15 years old, we start praying. You can calculate how many pr uh, obligatory prayers we can say during our life. All of this is just for internal use for ourselves. The same with fasting. From 15 years old until 70 years old, of course, the Babis was from 11 to 42 years old, but Baha'is fast from 15 to 70 years old. When you calculate it, I remember I calculated, I don't have it with me, if I, I say it from memory, it's about 1,042 days we fast in our lives. More than 1,000, about 1,040 or something. So all of those, God is not somebody sitting there and says, okay, Darius, you missed five or 10, so you are short 100, so you fast in your life in 924 instead of 1,042. Now you go to a different location in the next world. It doesn't work like that at all. So everything, praying, fasting, um, obligatory prayer, and all of that is for our own good, for our own brain, and our 
brain is designed for that, as I mentioned. Whether we like it or not, praying calm our neurons in our brain. When our neurons are calmed through praying and meditation, after that we are calmed, then we think differently. Then we act differently. That's why it's important, pray and meditation. Just praying, it does not really do an effective job. After praying, any way you like to, to reflect, any way you like to meditate, it would be good as long as it calms your brain, your neurons down, as long as it makes you relax. If you relax, then yes, you see the result. Ideas come to your mind even after you die. And ideas come to your mind, you think about those ideas sometimes. And then those ideas, as I said, you just don't jump on it and do exactly what comes to your mind. And you can say, yes, I was inspired. Or Persian says, Behem uh, el should. You just, I'm inspired what to do. This cannot be necessarily a good way to approach the prayer. After this inspiration, you need to consult, consult with the expert, with the well-intended people, and then act. Then we see the result. The calmness is a cornerstone of the prayer uh, when we pray, the calmness in our brains, in the neurons of our brains. Uh, I don't know if I, I hope I answered the question. I, when I ask, I just say, keep talking. Abdul Baha says, let your actions day by day be beautiful prayers. Can you comment on this? Exactly. That's, that's what exactly I said at the beginning. This was a revolutionary concept presented by Abdul Baha that you don't see it in any other religions, any other thinkers, that your action is your prayer. That's why it says Abdul Baha gave, gave a definition, new definition of prayer. One definition is prayer by word. Second definition Abdul Baha gave was this statement that you just mentioned. A statement not by word, but by action. That your action, beautiful action, because friends, one of the main goals of praying is see to is to see is to see the result of it. To re the realization of the prayer is to, to visualize, meaning to see it in action. That's why we know Abdul Baha didn't, in seven days a week, a week, if I tell you what he did, you realize that seven days a week, not without any exceptions, he was very, very busy, extremely busy. From Monday through Sunday, even, even Friday mornings in Akka, he used to go to mosque in Akka, Al-Jazzar, the mosque of Al-Jazzar, if you have been in Akka. He used to go there, and actually he used to have a small room in that mosque, anyway. And after that, he used to go and help others any way he could. Seven days a week, he had Monday, doing, going to certain area of Akka. Tuesday, another going walking certain areas of Akka. Tuesday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, he had divided the city of Akka in different areas, and he knew about one hundred fifty needy people who used to live in Akka, the poor people, and more than that. The people who were sick, even Lua Getzinger mentioned, Lua Getzinger go to Haifa to visit Abdul Baha. And Abdul Baha says, I feel really sick these days. I don't feel good. Uh, I cannot go out of home. I need to rest. Lua, I'm going to ask you, please go to certain home. Abdullah give her the address, go there, 
and you'll see a Muslim guy, somebody very, very old, and he's very poor, and he doesn't know and doesn't have anybody to help him, go uh, this time on my behalf and help him out. And what I want you to do is go give him his medicine. You know that Dr. Josephine Falsheer was a medical doctor for several years living in Akka and she was a friend of the of Abdul Baha's family and she was on a payroll and she had to take care of the medical issues. And she provided medicine for this old man. Abdul Baha gave him the gave her gave the Loa Getzinger this medicine and he said, go to that man, give him this medicine, cook some food for him, prepare some food for a few days for him, clean him home, clean his home make it all in good shape for today. And please do that on my behalf. I can't really, cannot move. I feel bad. He was sick that day. And Loa Getzinger go, and not too long after, maybe maybe 30 minutes or maybe an hour, just shortly after that, Loa Getzinger comes back. Abdul Ba was surprised. Loa, what happened? It takes the whole day. Why you're back? And Lua says, sir, really, uh, I can't say, I can't stay there. Abdullah says, why? He says, when I went there, his home, his room was, uh, smelled so bad. And he was in such a bad shape and it was filthy and I couldn't really stand it. And I tried to cover my mouth because of the uh, smell, but... I couldn't. I'm so sorry, Abdul Ba. Abdul Ba says, no, 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 no. You are there on my behalf. Today I cannot go and you have to go back and do just one time for me. And Lord gets in and says, yes. Sir. And she went back and she did it for Abdul. This is one of hundred things that Abdul Ba did. So, as I said, if I tell you every day what he did, once every, I mean, there's no time for that, but every day he did something to serve. That's why service, the actions, as you, as you read, the actions becomes your prayer. That's why it says this was revolutionary in the Bible, in the, throughout the history of religions, that when you do something, you serve others, the action, that action, that service, becomes your prayer. That's why Abdul Ba used to say, I, I every day I am praying. Oh no, he said I I'm praying all the time. All the time. So that's what it exactly means. That he is serving all the time. One way or the other. It's a lot of stories about Abdul. That's exactly what it is. Your action can become if not, it would be like in many different countries, they just go to the temple, just pray, just feel good, and come back and continue to be the same. If everything before prayer and after prayer is the same, the prayer is not useful. So prayer needs as a tool, as an instrument, needs to make some changes to some degree in our lives and in our life, to some degree. When we even fast, the before 19 days and after 19 days, it needs to be different. It need, we need to create in this mentality that how we can improve ourselves and our lives and how we can be of a service can be service to yourself too, but it needs to see a change when we pray. So the action is like that. So the action really, action is a, that's why he said at the beginning that it is revolutionary, this concept. It's revolutionary. Like, let me tell you another example. I don't want to take much of your time. Try to limit myself. You know, becoming a Baha'i, you know, uh, the guardian says, 
it takes a lifetime to become a Baha'i. One thing is that we can register our name to become a Baha'i, meaning we, there is a card to be signed that we accept the Baha'i faith, the Baha'u'llah is a new manifestation of God and the whole thing. We, we administratively, yes, we, beca we became a Baha'i, administratively. But to become a Baha'i, a real Baha'i, it takes a lifetime according to the guardian. That it takes lifetime to, uh, to, because it's becoming a Baha'i. It's not like this in Islam. In Islam, when you say a sentence, you become a Muslim. That's it. But in the Baha'i faith, you have to, we have to work on it. It's not guaranteed. Yeah, we entered administratively, yes, but we have to work it. That's why the Baha'is from our childhood, who were raised in Iran like me, we used to say a very famous sentence. Uh, what do you say that in English? We say, Baha'i ra be sefat shenasan na be es. Meaning the Baha'is are known, Baha'is needs to become a Baha'i because of the virtues, not just the name. The Islam is not like that at all. You can become, you can say a sentence, become a Muslim. You can say a ashad, ashad anna la ilaha illallah, then Muhammad Rasulullah, you're Muslim. That's it. So everything is to becoming. And prayer is a tool that help us in this process of becoming. Prayer and meditation. Always, friends, it goes hand in hand. Prayer and meditation. Thank you so much. Um, I think that's all the time we have, but thank you so much for giving us your time and speaking on this topic. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for your invitation. So I wish you all the best. I hope I could maybe give you a different perspective of prayer. Thank you very much. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Our speaker next week will be Mr. Dwight Bashir, and his topic will be why Baha'is are political but not partisan. So these talks are every Saturday at noon Eastern time, and I've put the link to our uh, mailing list and our YouTube channel in the chat where this talk will be uploaded afterwards. Thank you, everyone. See you next week. Bye.